Hey guys, this is Mike Mahaffey, the old bastard BJJ guy, here for BJJ Mental Models. Back in my day, we had to walk uphill in the snow both ways to get to the academy just to learn some crappy technique from a random purple belt. You kids have it so easy, because now you can just subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium and get tons of great audio courses to learn new techniques, enhance your mindset, and entertain yourself. You can even get personalized rolling reviews from some of your favorite BJJ Mental Models coaches, including me. It's like having your own seminar, you spoiled little whippersnappers. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium right now. Get off my lawn and go train. Hey, this is Steve from BJJ Mental Models. If you've been following the feed, then you know that yesterday we released an April Fool's Day episode. And, you know, I always want to give you guys and girls quality jujitsu educational content. So I feel a little bit bad that this week's episode was a joke. Actually, that's a lie. I don't feel bad about it at all. That's how I entertain myself. <laughs> this is a free podcast. It costs a lot of time and money to put together. So this is how I get compensation back from everyone on the free tier. But all the same, I'm going to do you a favor. For consistency's sake, I'm going to put out a real episode here. What you're about to hear is part of a new series that we're doing for our BJJ Mental Models Premium customers. This is a new audio course we're making called Grappling with Confidence. The idea is to have a series of conversations with some of the highest level athletes I can find to get them to share their tips and tricks on building, maintaining, and restoring confidence in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's ideal for competitors, but honestly, I know a lot of hobbyists have trouble with confidence as well, so I think this is going to be an episode that helps everybody. This one features Joseph Chen fresh off his ADCC Europe win. I'm excited to have this chat with Joseph. He's a longtime fan and friend of the show. So here you go. And of course, if you want more of this, check out BJJ Mental Models Premium. There's a link in the show notes if you want to learn more. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models Premium. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, I'm back with a, a BJJ Mental Models vet, Mr. Joseph Chen. How's it going, Joseph? I'm doing well. How about you? I am also doing well. I am ultra excited to have this conversation. As I was telling you, this one has been on my mind for quite a while. What we're going to do here is we're going to have a series of conversations about building confidence. I mean, I don't know how often you get this question, Joseph, but for me, this is probably one of the most common listener questions we get is, how do I build and maintain confidence as a grappler? Both pros deal with this all the time because, I mean, I can't think of many things in life that are more stressful than a, a high-profile loss, right? I mean, some people really struggle with that and losing is inevitable in the sport, but also hobbyists tend to really beat themselves up as well, often because they're training with pros and they hold themselves to kind of an unfair standard. And I think that one of the beautiful things about jiu-jitsu is its ability to help you build confidence confidence. So my goal here is to talk to some of the best minds and best competitors in the sport and unpack from you guys and girls how you do this. But Joseph, just in case people miss the memo, they don't know your story, why don't we introduce you here again? I mean, I know you've been on the main feed, but you can regale us all with the story of how a, uh, a strange Australian man ruined your life with the power of jiu-jitsu and what you're up to these days. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. So right now I'm representing the B team. So as of late, I think most people probably know me from winning European trials, but before that I competed quite a few times, most primarily coming out of China, but then also based in Austin half the time, sometimes New York, traveling a fair bit, but yeah. Awesome. And hey, for those who don't know Joseph and want to learn more, there was that amazing video that Alec Balding released recently that kind of chronicled your rise and the way that you think about jujitsu. And I really love that video. I'll put a link in the show notes. So if people want to kind of understand Joseph's approach, there's two places you can go to. One is the previous chat that we had on the main feed with him, but also there was this just incredible video package that put this together. But I guess we can turn this around to you, Joseph, now, and I'll just give you the floor. I mean, what are your thoughts on confidence as a grappler? Is this something that you've struggled with in the past? And what have you done to kind of move towards a solution to that? How do you ultimately build and maintain and cultivate confidence as a grappler? So I think there are a lot of ways that like this has been talked about in this space. Like I think in terms of confidence, there's a couple of ways you can approach the question. It's like confidence in your game, confidence in competition, so on and so on. And so 
I think there's a, a few facets in which you can talk about confidence in the context of jiu-jitsu. So, like, a few ways that I like to think about it is, like, having confidence in technique and how that may affect you, and then ways you can start looking at develop confidence in certain areas. Like, something that I've thought about a fair bit in the past is how, and I'm sure many people have actually, where it's, like, your confidence in technique will determine your ability to use it effectively. This is an issue that I've tried to overcome in the past because I think at some point in time when someone gets fairly competent at doing one thing it can become difficult for you to start looking to gravitate to other areas just because now you have a degree of success here so you've gained a degree of confidence in a certain technique or a certain area and so having to leave that and I find it's good to think of yourself in a way I think some people associate themselves as a certain type of player like all I'm a certain guard player or I'm a certain type of passing player. And I think this can be good because you can develop a greater degree of confidence in a certain area. However, it's also hard for to develop confidence in your jiu-jitsu as a whole because then when you try to gravitate towards other areas or you have to have to do something new because of the context of the situation, then you really lack confidence there. So something that I had to work on for a while was my, my wrestling. Because I felt like in training, I did my wrestling and I felt fairly competent. But then bringing it into the competitive environment, it was very difficult. Just because it was something that I wasn't used to doing against, like, I was good. I was used to doing it against people who are good in the gym. But then in the, like, the pressure of competition, it, it became a lot more difficult. Yeah, that makes a world of sense to me. I love how you've drawn a delineation between having confidence in one thing versus having confidence across the board. I've definitely had that experience where I might have confidence in my ability to do one or two techniques and as such, I can be effective at them because I have the skill and also I have the confidence, which helps a ton. But the problem is that can also be a bit of a trap because if you have a lot of confidence in one area of your jujitsu, you can wind up in this trap where you kind of stay within that comfort zone because that is where you have confidence and it can kind of prevent you from going outside and trying new things. And I think it's important for people to have an A game that they understand and can define and have confidence in, but they also have to be willing to try new things and experiment and grow their confidence, right? Because confidence is supposed to be there to help you be resilient and improve your performance. It's not there to be a crutch that steers you away from studying new stuff and developing other areas of your game. Yeah, most definitely. I definitely view confidence as like means to do something like especially in jiu-jitsu i guess as a means to like do something in a more competitive situation or in a more timely manner per se and i think this is just once again in the context of like performing a movement or a technique right i think we could t take it to other areas but just for the time being we'll, we'll i'll discuss it in this context where like if you're confident in something, you're able to make it more effective. For example, if I want to hit a duck under, especially movements that are time sensitive, like a, like a duck under or various types of shots, you want to have confidence in a shot to make it work. Maybe you understand how to set up and then how you're going to look to or go about taking the shot, but especially against someone who is similar level to you and so on, you're going to have to have a degree of confidence because it's the likelihood is you're going to meet like some degree of resistance. And the confidence will help you overcome that resistance. I think this is actually like quite important to understand. And I think my goal is trying to develop a game like I'm trying to figure out where I lack confidence and then really work in those areas. So like, so how did you go about, first of all, understanding that this is an area of weakness? Because that kind of introspection is something that people sometimes struggle with. And then once you figure that out, how did you go about building actual games and drills and training routines to develop that area because we talk so much in jiu-jitsu about ways to develop our technical skill but we don't talk about ways to develop our mental skill things like confidence right that's something that often doesn't get taught in the classroom yeah absolutely and i think there are a couple ways that you can go about doing it like for me first like it's a two-part question right the first of all is like how do i how would i look to like identify this so i think there are like two main ways, like obviously introspection is very useful, but also having someone who is more objective in their, in the way they see your jujitsu. Because I think, at least I can speak for myself, but I'm sure this rings true for a lot of other people where you're kind of biased when you look at your own jujitsu, whether you're too hard on yourself or you're too easy on yourself, it can ring true in both regards, depending on 
of the situation. But sometimes I can introspect and I can come to the conclusion, oh, I feel like these areas are weak for me. And this is a good sign of this is when you're rolling with someone and you're deliberately trying to like avoid this area. Something like, let's say, okay, I feel good in the standing position, but I really want to avoid playing over-unders. So this is basically um, a sign that you're lacking confidence in this area. And sometimes it can be rightfully so. Maybe this person's very competent there. But I feel like that almost presents itself as an opportunity to improve in that area. When you find someone with a high degree of competence, I find it's an opportunity to really dive deep in on that position. I think there's some variables that need to be taken into consideration in order to do so. For example, like I need to make sure this person's safe. I want to make sure... <laughs> I think that's probably one of the main ones and that they're willing to like go through this process with me and then I can try to learn from them. But if you're scared that, oh, they're going to do some crazy move that's going to injure me, then once again, the willingness to take risks and fail, like so we can like, <laughs> we'll talk about Josh Boyd's kind of, it's like investing in failure, right? I think in order to develop confidence, we have to be very willing to do so, uh, willing to invest in failure. So taking a few like losses per se in terms of, oh, trying something and failing and then eventually being able to overcome that. And I find like kind of disassociating myself is very peaceful in that in the sense where I get choked by someone I wouldn't regularly get choked by. This is fine because it doesn't really matter. And too, I'm like trying to work on stuff. And so I find that's generally how I would look to approach it in this regard. Yeah, that makes sense. I know a lot of people when they have a setback in training, their tendency is to retreat. So if they get tapped by someone that they feel they shouldn't be getting tapped by, they'll beat themselves up, they'll get frustrated, they'll kind of maybe avoid that person in the future. And that's a very dangerous habit to get into because that's a growth opportunity. And I mean, we've talked, all of us have talked so many times about the importance of thinking of jujitsu in the lab, in the training room, as a team-based collaborative thing. You're not there to win medals in the gym. You're there to help you and your partners learn as well. I found for me that honestly, the thing that helps the most, if I suffer just an absolutely debilitating, embarrassing loss, is to lean into it, right? I mean, if I'm in the gym and I don't know, some white belt jumps on me and neck cranks me until I tap, <laughs> right? There's, there's a few things I can do. I guess one thing is I can get pissed off and I can storm off the mat and never roll with that person again. Or what I can do is just smile and congratulate the person and say, you know what? You really caught me off guard. I'm impressed. That doesn't happen much. You did amazing. You know that. And it's a learning opportunity for both you and the other person. And if you eat a bad loss in the gym and your instinctual response is to come back and say, wow, man, that was amazing. You did a great job. How can I learn how to defend against that next time? You kind of make it sound like well, this is actually what I wanted this whole time, right? And that is what we want. We want practice losing in the gym. And if you lean into that, I find sometimes that kind of impacts your own psychology and you can kind of trick yourself. And before you know it, those gym losses don't hurt as much as maybe they used to. Yeah, absolutely. I think gym losses are good because like it's there's very little pressure. Most of that pressure that you would experience would be self-imposed unless, I mean, we could talk about gym culture, but I'll refrain for now. But I guess some gym culture, it may be one way, maybe the other, but at least for the gyms that I train at, I find that there isn't really much external pressure in terms of winning and losing, right? Everyone gets caught sometimes. I just wish I could catch Craig more frequently. But in this regard, I find that like having a good gym, and I think people talk about this where it's like having the right people around you is very useful because they'll have not only like, obviously everyone wants to improve, but they'll also have your self-interests in mind and you with them, right? So like, for example, like when like I catch someone or someone catches me, I try to engage in a dialogue with them talking about, oh, what happened and so on and so on. So that you can like, like what you were saying earlier, there's something to be taken away from the failure that happened, right? And I think this is a very healthy habit to get into. And then it, like you said, I find it, it's a really good way to start looking to like, yeah, make it a more enjoyable thing and not make it such a salty thing. Yeah. And the irony, too, is that this is something that becomes harder as you get more experienced. At least that has been my personal journey. As you practice jujitsu and get areas of competence and get good at things, it feels good to be good at things. It feels good to go in there and have an A game that you can deploy and beat most of the people around you. But what you find is if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, you kind of sit at that level. You don't advance. And then all of the other people around you, they're just going to catch up. So you always have to be looking to extract yourself out of that comfort zone. And it does get hard when you know in your mind that 
you have a game you can play that's probably going to get you the tap right now, but you also know that playing that game is not in your best interests because you won't learn if you just do that same thing over and over again. Maybe like you mentioned earlier, there's weaknesses you've identified in your game and they need your focus right now. Makes more sense to go to those, even if it means you're going to have a, a less than stellar performance in the gym. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you could distinguish between like one versus the other as someone who's more geared towards short-term versus long-term like results. Right, just something, at least for me as a competitor, something that I've had to take into consideration. Like, obviously, I, I want to be able to beat fairly good people, right? My three main losses are getting ankle locked by Mateusz Szczynski, getting taken down by Kenta, and then getting choked by Andrew Tackett. And so I can say, like, fairly well that every time like I engage, like, after one of those happens, like, it's a very good sign that, okay, this is an area of weakness, and I can get try work on this. Right. And I would spend like a fair bit of time trying to work that deliberately. And I find that like most people are very willing to help you. I think most people can really understand this. Like, especially when you have a gym culture, everyone wants everyone to get better. I find that this, is, this can be very useful and similar to what you're saying. I think you've touched on the importance of culture as well. I mean, culture in, is contagious. Emotions are contagious. And if you are in a culture that is highly combative, where the people don't help each other, no matter your best intentions, it's going to be very hard to work together as a team and shore up your weaknesses together. So that is an important variable. Confidence isn't always about yourself. It's about the interactions you have with the people around you. I've certainly been in environments before where I wound up leaving because I just didn't feel that it was conducive to good training. I just didn't feel like it was helping me develop skills in the way that I wanted to. And I know a lot of these gyms exist. For better or worse, jujitsu is pretty much unregulated. There's not really any universal standard for what you need to do to open a jiu-jitsu gym. Anyone can do it, including people who don't really even train jiu-jitsu. So you can find a lot of gyms out there that just really suck and have a really toxic negative culture. And I think your ability to build yourself up is going to be pretty limited if the people around you aren't invested in also helping build you up as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like there's a lot to be said in trying to find a useful gym in, in regards to, because uh, I think something I've heard a lot was like, how a lot of people can have confidence in competition. Like I've heard like a bunch of the DDS say this is like where you have a lot of confidence in your training or it's like you have great training partners, you have a great training environment, you had good preparation and this was where you can derive a lot of confidence from. And obviously not everyone's a competitor, but there's a lot to be taken from this in regards to like your own jiu-jitsu. It's like understanding that I've gone through the process that I should be going through in regards to trying to build my game and build confidence in certain areas and there are more practical skills that like I'm overlooking right now just like talking it broadly but I think this is what, like one of the more important things is obviously you don't want confidence to uh, be like solely reliant on things outside of you but it can be something that can be very helpful and I think it speaks to the importance of surrounding yourself with people like let's say like good to be around in this regard. Yeah, something that Rob Bernacki has talked about on the podcast with us is building and cultivating a, a confidence-based mindset where the confidence comes from trust in the quality of your training and not a desire for a certain outcome. So an example being, you know, if your entire confidence is derived from your win-loss record, that's only going to hold up as long as you're winning. <laughs> as soon as you lose, your confidence goes through the toilet and then you may never get it back again. You see this in combat sports all the time where athletes look unbeatable until one day they lose and they just, they're never able to rebound from that. And it's just a downward spiral from there on out. But as you've brought up, if you go into a tournament confident that you have done the best that you could have done to prepare and confident that you've been training with the best team that you could to help prepare you and you accept the possibility of a win or a loss and just commit to go out there and doing the best you can, that's a pretty strong way to build evidence-based confidence. You have reason to be confident, but you're also not married to the result. I really like that approach. It's something, again, like I mentioned, Rob has talked about on the podcast with us. Yeah, I actually recall that episode. I thought I really enjoyed him talking about it. I feel like he offered it like a different perspective than what I've heard previously from other people. Something like that I thought was actually quite interesting as well. I, I read a book a while back at this point. It was called like The Chim Paradox. And it talked about a few things in regards to like, like ma managing the self, but I'll refrain from talking from that too much. But in the book, it made the distinction in regards to like goals and dreams. So like 
basically the main distinction was goals are in your control, whereas dreams aren't. So for example, like a competition like result is a dream because this isn't how you'd conventionally use the word dream, but I find making that distinction is very useful because then you're not necessarily, you're like, okay, this is a dream of mine. I understand that this isn't necessarily a certainty. You know, there's very little I can control in this regard because there's so much that can be at play in a competition. Whereas a goal would be, okay, I want to study for X amount of time or I want to try making the gym these days and so on and so on. And I find that kind of similar to what you were saying earlier, where it's like, this is where you can derive a lot of confidence from as opposed to, yeah, what you said, like your win-loss record or how good you are like competitively all the time. Because I think something that's very important in terms of long-term growth and long-term confidence is you're going to have to take some losses and you're going to have to be able to overcome that. And then having confidence in that as opposed to, oh, I'm always going to win. I think that's something that can be quite good. Yeah. Something that Rob talked about is the importance of identifying as I'm the person who meets their commitments. They do what they say they're going to do. And kind of having that as being a baseline of of where your confidence comes from. Not necessarily I'm the guy who is XYZ world champion, but rather I am the person who always does their best to prepare and go out there and compete and perform. It's just a a stronger engine for confidence. And it's just interesting because this is a problem not unique to jujitsu. You see the exact same problem in business. Goal setting (laughs) is a huge problem in business, right? Setting objectives and then trying to, to hit those objectives and people miss them more often than they hit them a lot of the time. But a big part of where this comes from is setting goals that are possibly outside of your control for some reason. And I love that distinction of the difference between goals versus dreams. Goals being things you can control about your training, about your conduct, and dreams ultimately being the outcome. And I think it makes sense to have both of them. Nick Perler, we talked to him on our one of our other premium series, and something that he advises is kind of a similar way to explain what you just talked about. He always says, keep two sets of records. You've got the external set of records, which is your win-loss record. That's the record everyone else sees. But then you've got the internal record, and that is you gauging yourself against your own performance and where you want to be. And that might not necessarily be winning and losing. It might be, hey, I'm competing against someone who's already beat me three times. I mean, I'm hoping I can win, but you know what? Worst case scenario, I want to go in there and just put up a super competitive performance and close the spread versus where I was last time. You know, something that that is maybe a little bit more manageable. And that's even a little bit different from what you're saying because you're talking about goals being something that you have full control over. And usually that means habits, right? That means things that you can actually control on a day-by-day basis. Those are something that we all have control over. And so I, I think that people don't celebrate that enough because habits are the engine to the result that you want. You know, you can set a goal saying you want to be a world champion, but it is going to be the habits that you build that get you there. And so I think it's better to celebrate those as the engine for your confidence than any potential outcome that may or may never happen. Uh, yeah, most definitely. At least for me at this point in my career, like I've taken a few wins and losses. But I think something that's helped me a lot is like I don't really enjoy either too much. Like not to say like I don't enjoy like there's a degree of joy I get from it. It's more of a, OK, cool, wonderful, as opposed to like, oh, like getting super hyped. I've, and then similarly for losses, it's like I feel similarly. I think an emotional attachment to either or I feel like can make it so that I'm really adverse to losses. Obviously, no one wants to lose, but I don't want it to have to affect me emotionally to a greater degree. And I find that if I enjoy wins and then that's too much, then again, it it can feed into how much losses affect me. So I feel like this is something that is still applicable in the training room. It's like if you do something well and then you have a great day, it's like you don't want to celebrate that too much. Don't say you can't. If you take that... To, uh, like feel that tie too much then I feel like the next time where it might not be as great it's going to feel uh, quite a bit worse so just having like the more uh, objective like viewpoint in this regard I think is very very useful and actually I quite like what Nick Perler puts out actually I probably try to listen to more of him as of like that I feel like he puts out some good ideas yeah I'll send you some of his stuff he's got a lot of thoughts on confidence specifically and I mean I think a big kind of common thread that everyone is saying is you need to disassociate yourself from your win-loss record and focus on constant progressive improvement of the self. Um, That is a better 
measure of success than anything that's on paper is, hey, am I better today than I was last month, last year? That ultimately is a better indicator. And I think that it's healthier. And I think ultimately, like we talked about earlier, that's the thing that if you do want to be a high level performer, that's the mentality you want anyway, because if you're going to put this much work into things at a high level, eventually you're going to have some losses. They're going to be very public, right? And you need to make sure that whatever engine you're using to build your confidence, it's resilient enough that it can overcome loss. And you're right. If part of your confidence comes from celebrating big wins, well, it's really hard to celebrate the big wins and ignore losses. This is a mindset thing that Uh, Perler has also talked about well, which is the idea of dwelling on your wins and shaking off your losses, but that can be very, very difficult to do. And I think kind of taking a step back and looking at these things more objectively as almost like a science experiment, you know, you go out, you try something, you either succeeded or you failed. But either way, that's just knowledge that you can apply to get a better result next time. It's not the result that you're necessarily married to. It's just part of the process. And so kind of thinking of jujitsu like an experiment where you're not really married to the wins and losses, I think is a great mentality too. Yeah, I find that ultimately that's actually quite interesting what you're saying in regards to what he said in terms of like dwelling on your wins and shaking off the loss. I think this is a good way to go about doing things. I think obviously it's good to focus on either or, right? Obviously it's good to focus on your losses when you want to like try to build upon your game and make adjustments, but also you definitely want to enjoy a win to that degree. Interesting, I'm trying to think like, how I would try to fit that into like my understanding of my jiu-jitsu and confidence and so on. He's talking mostly when he talks about this, about when you reflect, when you kind of look back and you think of yourself and you, you know, you're kind of sitting in bed at night and you got I- thoughts and ideas going through your head, trying to focus more on the positive than on the negative, right? Really, it's just a positive thinking activity. Whenever you're sitting in bed dwelling on, oh, fuck, I lost that tournament. What Nick is suggesting is that instead of dwelling on that loss, to try to reframe your thinking, to think about the good things that have happened. That's not to say that you are disregarding the bad things that happened, and you do absolutely need to think about them because that's how you learn. You take that feedback and you go back to the lab and you apply it. But what he's talking about is when you're sitting there in your own head, you know, you're, you're, it's just you and your thoughts, which is kind of the scariest place to be. You want to make sure that the ideas that you're spending your mental bandwidth on are thinking about the things that lift you up and not the things that pull you down. So that's one approach. I also think that the approach you brought up of just kind of like a Zen level of detachment also works really well. But I think the most important thing, however you do it, is don't dwell on your losses. Accept that they happened, learn from them, but don't be emotionally attached to the fact that they happened. And definitely don't think of them and internalize them to the point where you think of yourself as a loser, because that's the worst thing you can do for your confidence. Yeah, absolutely not. That's... Very true, very true. I find that it's actually good. I like the way you described that, where it's like you kind of like you want to take what you can from your losses, but then, yeah, not definitely not associating yourself as a like someone who loses. And like something I find that I actually quite enjoy is like kind of like this kind of taking a step back a little bit and kind of seeing like to the point in which you progressed. And I find like I would say this is like uh, can be relatable to most people especially uh, unless you're like brand new white belt but like for me like sometimes especially I'll take a step back and think about like when I first started training is like what were some of the thoughts I had and then what were some let's say some of the things I was like wow oh my god this guy's a blue belt he's so good and I'm like I would genuinely think oh my god this guy's amazing and then I'd look back and I'd be like oh wow I've made it past that like a fair degree and I it's a pretty crazy thing and the amount of progress one can make and I feel like this can be something that's fairly uplifting. And you can have confidence in your ability to engage in that process where it's like overcoming whatever resistance that you may have encountered and like being able to continue and work forward. I think this is actually something that I've thought about a lot. And I find this can be a good, not only like a motivator, right? But it's also a good sign that you can kind of understand that you're able to engage in this process of like improving and dealing with loss. And like, I find that at least for me, most people who train for X amount of years, you've, you've improved a fair bit and you've gotten to a point where it's like, wow, if you think about where you were before and where you are then, it's like you've engaged in this process of like improving and so on and so on and overcoming resistance. And then understanding that it's like, oh, well, I've done that. I'm fairly good at that. As I can see, I think this is something that one can like derive confidence from per se or Or just like understand that we talked about different facets of confidence, whether it be per technique, but it's just like 
yeah, you're ob- you're confident that you're going to be able to overcome the problem. I think I heard one of my friends speak about, we were talking about like different people and their approaches to competition, right? And apparently like Hamul al-Bahal, he wouldn't necessarily have a game plan, but he would have like, he'd have a strong belief that he would be able to overcome every problem in regards to whatever he would encounter. I find obviously this can be good and bad, right? You don't want to just believe anything and not, not do any preparation, right? You're like, oh, I'll be able to figure it out on the fly. But also trusting in that your preparation, you it's prepared yourself adequately where you're able to overcome any problem. I think this is a good idea to kind of think of yourself as, if that makes sense. 100%. And I think the important distinction there is you're trusting yourself that you have prepared as best you can to be ready to overcome any problem. But that is different from trusting that you absolutely will overcome every problem. You're trusting in the quality of your prep. You're trusting in the process. And that is different from promising yourself an outcome that may be out of your control, that may never happen, right? I mean, you could do, you could be just a shoehorn winner. You know, you could be a shoe in winner to win some major tournament and then get injured two days beforehand and now you're out, right? Things happen. You can't always control the outcome, but what you can do is you can build confidence around the process that you use to get there. Yeah, absolutely. I think this relates to a lot of things that we, that we covered already, like in terms of culture, in terms of like training modality and stuff like this. We'll go maybe go into something a little bit more specific because this is something, at least for me, preparation for competition, something I've had to consider. Structuring my training to try to overcome things that I'm not confident in. So for example, I'd say wrestling and ankle locks is something that I've struggled with in the past. And so structuring my training to kind of account for that. And if you don't mind, we'll go on this tangent where it's more more technical and more practical. Kind of figuring out, I like to play like, I like to do specific rounds or play certain games where I can really develop this type of skill. So like, I know like a lot of people are into the ecological now, but for me back in the day, this was like, Fuck Your Jiu-Jitsu by Rob, right? This is obviously taking it a little bit of a different direction. It's not just disrespecting someone's Jiu-Jitsu, but it's also trying to work for a desired outcome where, okay, I want to try and make sure that when I'm in these positions, First of all, I'm going to be fine. So like maintaining certain positions and having confidence in your ability to maintain a certain degree of safety, whether it's like, okay, I'm not going to get taken down. I'm not going to get thrown. I'm not going to get pinned or, okay, I'm not going to get finished. I'm not going to be taken into a worse position and so on and so on. Yeah, that is a great way to think of things. I mean, I love Rob's fuck your jujitsu system for those who uh, have missed the memo on that. Basically, it's a kind of a form of gamification where you create games for yourself to basically maximize the challenge. The idea is you are stepping into your opponent's best game and you're basically saying, hey, fuck your jujitsu. <laughs> As in, I am going to grapple with you and demonstrate that I have no fear by just walking into the best possible situation for you and kind of fighting your way out of it. So a practical example of this that I do, you know, I'm a black belt, I'm sparring with a lot of white belts. And So to make things easier for them, sometimes I will intentionally wade into whatever guard they want and let them get it fully set up. So I'll basically let them get into a fully locked in X guard and then see from there, can I still get out? If I give this person every other advantage, is my jujitsu still good enough that I can overcome that? The thing I love about that approach is it scales regardless of the relationship between you and your opponents. Problem a lot of black belts have is it can be hard to get a good competitive role out of someone who's much more junior than you. Hey, guess what? If you play fuck your jujitsu, it's easy to do that because you just make things intentionally hard for yourself. And it's a little bit different from traditional constraints like positional sparring because you're not really trying to work a specific position necessarily. You're just trying to make things as hard for yourself as you possibly can so that you have to work as hard as you possibly can to get out. It's just, it's a really cool system. I'll also put a link in the show notes to the chat we had with Rob about his system because it's just, it's a really great gamified way that you can level up your practice without even having to involve your partner or your teacher. It's something that any grappler can do by themselves, which is what I really like about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is at least... It was one of my early influences. I still think about it quite frequently to this day where it's like, okay, how can I? And I think the great thing about this is like, you're basically trying to give them every advantage you possibly can and still not make it work. Obviously, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, right? Taking it to that point and figuring out how far you can take it um, in training, it's going to translate over very well because you're going to gain a deeper understanding and subsequently you'll get a better confidence in the position just because you put so much time and 
how much thought and energy into one position, especially with like a certain, sometimes I think the best way to do this is with a certain training partner where you guys can build off of each other. For me, some great training partners, for example, one of my favorites, like Kenta, will have rounds where it's like we constantly will be doing like a specific type of drill or like a game or however so, and we'll just keep building on it. I feel like this is one of the greatest things and not obviously not everyone can have that, but sometimes you're under the constraints of, oh, I don't necessarily have all the time to like uh, freely train the way I want to or so on and so on. But I find that like, at least for me, uh, wherever I've gone, I've been able to find like one person who's willing to train with me in this matter. And I find like just one person is enough because obviously some people will have their own preferences for things, but just because you have that ability to then have such a short feedback loop and then constantly build on that, build on that, build on that. And then I find that I can become quite effective uh, just like in an, like an hour session. Yeah. And now something else that you brought up earlier, which I'd love to expand on, you talked about the importance of reflecting on how far you've come, uh, which is something that human beings in general are not good at doing. Human beings are very, very good at making themselves miserable and not good at remembering the happy times, right? And what they've accomplished, just something that we're not good at. I mean, anyone who has climbed a corporate ladder or competed extensively has had this experience where every once in a while you do get the big win and you're happy for about 30 seconds and then your brain's already moved on to something else. Whereas if you lose, you're going to be sitting there just dwelling on it for days and days and days. But I think you wisely bring up that if you reflect back on how far you've come, you are holding yourself to a completely different standard than you would have a year or two ago. You're moving the goalposts on yourself. A great example is what you talked about. When you showed up to jujitsu as a brand new white belt, you probably looked at the blue belts in the room as gods, basically people who would be impossible for you to submit because a blue belt was such an unthinkable level of skill when you're a new starting out white belt. And then before you know it, now suddenly you're the blue belt and then you're the purple belt and then you're the brown belt and then you're the black belt even. And man, you look back on those blue belts that you used to think were just absolute gods. But now when you're a black belt, you look at a blue belt and you think, oh, it's a beginner, <laughs> right? You've, you've completely changed your perspective. The, the person that you thought was an unbeatable killer, now they're just like almost indistinguishable from a white belt from your purposes if you're a black belt. That is something that I think everyone needs to stop and consciously do, which is reflect back on how far they've come and just understand if if you're beating yourself up consistently, you're probably moving the goalposts on yourself. You're probably more successful than you think you are. You're probably better than you think you are, but you're just not giving yourself permission to admit that. Yeah, absolutely. I think this thing, obviously, you don't want to always do that, right? You don't want to always, oh, I'm way better than I was before. So I'm just going to chill now. Obviously, this is not what I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because it can be like just a good way to understand and motivate yourself. I find, at least for me, it makes me feel quite happy in some senses because usually like I think it's called like the hedonic treadmill, right? We're trying to just constantly push, push, push. We want to go bigger, better, greater, whatever. Just changing it just for a little bit. I find it, it kind of refreshes everything and it kind of gives you a little bit of a new perspective on your current goal. I think the current goals one may set for themselves are still very valid. And for me, at least it's like, I still want to pursue the current goal goals, but sometimes I feel I put too much pressure on myself and I'm like, okay. This is, I have to do this. It's like, there feels like there's so much pressure in this regard, but then just stepping back and then seeing like how far one's, one has come, I find that that's, I don't know, very uplifting and very like, makes me quite happy being able to see, see them that far. Like sometimes I'll go through old videos, old, old things, old pictures and stuff like that. And it's quite a heartwarming journey. And I mean, I've done this like at this point, like throughout my career, since like each of the milestones in my life per se, when I was purple, when I was brown, and then all the things that happened in between is like, you can kind of each step of the way and you get a little bit further. It's like, wow, it's feels fairly pretty incredible because you're saying one like earlier, when you, you thought of these blue belts as like godlike, it's like everything seems much more attainable at that point. So it's like your goals now, it's like, oh, right now my goals seem as unattainable as blue belt was at that point. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is a good indicator that it's not so unattainable. I've been in this position before. Yeah, I remember when I was a white belt, the idea of just surviving against a blue belt, not even getting a tap or winning, but just surviving against a blue belt seemed unattainable. I remember being so proud of myself because 
I showed up to class and I sparred with a blue belt and I went two whole minutes without getting submitted. And I remember for me, that was a big win because normally 60 seconds was about as good as I could do. (laughs) And I remember that being a big win. Now, you know, you look back at time sparring with the same blue belt. I mean, it just you've moved so far past where you were and activities like journaling to keep track of your accomplishments, gratitude journaling. These are very helpful, powerful practices because Human beings are loss averse. We feel loss much more intensely than we feel gain. And so sometimes it's hard to forget all of the things you have done and all of the wins you have had. And so sometimes reminding yourself of that, it can give you a bit of perspective and it can be helpful to pull you out of just this constant negativity that you can get stuck in if you're, you know, dwelling on a loss or an upcoming match or something. Yeah, most definitely. And yeah, I don't really think there, it's super important to do that in regards to actually trying to take yourself out of that negative mindset. Just because ultimately, it's at least for I once again, for me, I feel this way. It's like uh, I might have some negative emotions, whether it's nerves, whether it's something like that on the lead up to a competition or so on or something. Let's say that I care about that the outcome matters to me. I have an emotional attachment to the outcome to some degree. Yeah, I think essentially I was just saying how once again, looking back and seeing it, it can be quite helpful with regards to how far you've come in like when you think about, oh. I'm nervous for this or so on and so on. This is at least for me in competition where, for example, my last competition, I fought someone I'd lost to uh, pretty badly to before. And there are a lot of like, nerves and a lot of fear going into uh, that match. So trying to not bring so much of that emotion with me and trying to think, okay, we'll kind of see how it goes somewhere. Goals and dreams, right? Where it's like met all my goals, similar to what Rob was saying, where it's like, okay, I've done everything within my control to try to maximize my ability to do this well. Uh, now, let's see, you know, because I think it's hard to have everything under your own control. If you try to control everything, I think I can almost make it worse. Yeah, yeah. If you try to micromanage yourself and have control of every single variable, you're just going to set yourself up for misery because that's just not possible. There's always going to be things that you can't control. And I think part of confidence is being willing to let go and not obsess about those things, which again, very hard thing for humans to do, right? We tend to, (laughs) we tend to be obsessive. And if something gets into our head, it can be hard to get it out sometimes. But uh, you know, a practice that Amy Campo has talked about is this idea of uh, mental gatekeeping and trying to make sure that you steer your thoughts away from the negative and instead you dwell on positive things, on things that are are supportive and and work towards your goals. It's a very hard practice to do. The best advice I've got on this is that when it comes to negative thoughts, you can't really stop yourself from having a thought, right? It's the old pink elephant thing. If I tell you don't think of a pink elephant, it's basically impossible for you to, to not think of the pink elephant. That's called the law of contrast. And the idea being by trying to not think about something, you make it way worse. So usually what you're better off doing instead of thinking, okay, don't think negatively, don't think negatively. You're better off filling your head with positive things and with things that support your goals and thinking about the people and the friends around you who are behind you the whole way. Um, That kind of stuff tends to be more productive than trying to deny yourself a thought because you just can't really do that, right? You can't really tell your brain to just not think about something. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, I, I actually really like that where it's filling your mind with positive things. And I think this is a lot of, uh, once again, like a good way to keep yourself going and understand what's like, oh, seeing how far you come, I'd say is like a very similar, along a very similar theme. And this is something that can be quite useful in this regard, I guess. Yeah, that's, yeah, because you don't want to be like, oh, I'm not going to think about the time I got fucked up. I'm not going to think about that time or that time. <laughs> I'm just going to, yeah, that's actually a very interesting way of putting it. Now, one thing I have really wanted to ask you about in some fields and careers, it's easy to do this. It's easy to just make a mistake. And if it doesn't go away, you just move on. You know, if you are, I don't know if you're a scientist, right? You do an experiment, either it meets your hypothesis or it doesn't, but either way you just move on and then you do another experiment. Jiu-jitsu competition is a bit different, especially at high levels. I mean, even at a local level, if you lose you're going to lose in front of hundreds of people, including your friends and family, right? (laughs) And then when you're competing at the level that you're competing at, Joseph, that's even another story because now you've got like entire internet communities dedicated to talking about Brazilian jiu-jitsu and dissecting conversations and stuff. I mean, Drew Foster on our own premium feed, we, he did a whole episode breaking down your ADCC run this year. And so, I mean, this has always got to be in your mind if you're a, a high performance athlete. But again, even if you are a local regional hobbyist, you're still 
knuckling up in front of hundreds of people. How do you remain confident in the face of all of that public criticism? Because that's something that I think most people don't have to deal with in the in their daily life, right? Just this whole internet full of people who want to just give them shit and tear them down. <laughs> How do you deal with that? I mean, I, I know some people engage with it. Some people just block everyone. But what is your thought on just kind of like dealing with the public when they've got opinions about your performance? Yeah. So, I mean, I think especially as like anyone who wants to compete at like a fairly high level, it's like going to be a reality of this. But, I mean, I know like some people have different thoughts on this. Some people are like, oh, Obviously, there's some people who really like to engage with it. <laughs> All those shit talk, the shit talkers. But, I mean, I'm pretty quiet on social media, but I'll look through the comments and so on. But so far, it seems like everyone's been super nice. I haven't seen that many people not be nice per se. But I'd say I almost don't really think about it. At least when I'm in that in that environment, like I'm about to compete and so on. Again, maybe I'll think about it more. Like maybe like a like day to day. Like I'm not so opposed to thinking about it. But when I'm competing, I basically don't even. I don't think of much. I'll like maybe have some of the techniques that I have in mind, some strategy tactics, and then that's it. I don't really like wearing headphones and listening to music. But I kind of like just being very used to the environment that I'm already in and then having being accustomed to it and being comfortable there. And then I just like to be like, I'd say pretty thoughtless in other regards. I find you can come kind of compartmentalize yourself to the point where all the emotions you can kind of experience after. But at the time of it happening, I, I don't think it's very useful to be super emotional. You could argue that there are, mo- there are times where it's like, if you're super emotional or super invested, maybe you can push it a little harder. But I mean, for me, at least it's it's less about like actually winning. It's more about trying to like exhibit good jujitsu and good technique and so on. If I win, but I, because I broke my arm and ate it and I still won, I don't, doesn't really feel like a win to me. <laughs> Yeah, understood, understood. But now on the topic of compartmentalization, man, how the fuck do you do it? Because <laughs> because I, I that's advice that probably everyone has received at some point is, you know, you should compartmentalize, but that requires tremendous mental discipline and it's hard to do. It's hard to just say to yourself, "Hey, I have this major competition coming up tomorrow." but that's tomorrow. So I'm just not going to think about it today. That's really hard to do. Do you have any exercises or tricks or things you've done that have kind of helped do that? Because that is a piece of advice that many people, myself included, have really struggled to apply sometimes. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I can't say how anyone can do this, but I can just say how I got this done. Whereas for me, I had my corner at the time, Dima, who was basically taking a coaching role on me. I felt I put a lot of my trust into him. So it was quite helpful for me because I basically relinquished most of my autonomy at the competition day because I would put unreasonable amount of trust in like, oh, whatever you say, I'll do. And so I was able to stay very calm and quite collected in this type of situation. Obviously, you don't want to do this all the time and you want to be quite mindful on who kind of possesses this role in, let's say, in your competition, right? Because if it's just anyone, it's like it it can be quite bad but like, you want to have someone that you trust that kind of understands your game and so on and so on this is how like i went about doing it obviously it might not be the most applicable for most people but yeah i definitely do think this is like quite a tough challenge and it's much easier said than done but if i already got myself in a position where i'll be like because i had a high degree of confidence in my corner and i thought very highly of them not only in regards to them but like their understanding of my game and then their understanding of my game plans and so on and so on in relation to what we're going to do that I could like kind of just impart, okay, you think we should play it like this? Okay, we're going to be doing it like this. And then in the match, like if I heard something, she say something, I'd be like, okay, we're going to do this, I guess. And so I think this is fairly useful in that way. So I, instead of, because I found that like in the past, I'd gotten to my head a little bit too much when competing. I'd think about, oh, I have certain thoughts where it's like, okay, I'm going to try maybe take it, take someone down, but then if they're if it's too hard, I'm just going to give up and so on and so on. And with someone that really doesn't give me that out, he's like, okay, you're going to take it down. It's like, well, I guess I can't pull guard down. So if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, you know, on the topic of using your team to kind of help prepare here, I got to ask at B team and at the other places you've trained in the past, have you ever trained at a place where they have a mindset component of instruction? So many gyms, they focus specifically on the technical side of things. 
course, as you prepare for a fight camp, there might be diet stuff involved as well. But I know that some schools have started integrating mindset coaching into their prep as well. And I would love to know if at B Team, this is something that you guys do, if there's a mindset aspect to the training that you use to build up your confidence before a match. I don't think they really have anything like this. I like to, it's discussed sometimes, especially on the lead up to competition. But at B Team, it's a mix of a few very different types of people. So, for example, like some people will share like how they approach something. And then it's like vastly different from how another equally successful approaches it. Someone who's equally successful. I think sharing and this is good and you can get better understanding of how and who someone is. But in terms of like trying to, something I really like about being at B-Team where it's it's pretty laser fair in there, let's say the way they run everything. So it's like you have a fair degree of autonomy and like you can make a lot of your own decisions in this regard. I'd say a lot of it's more like based the self there. People will share how they think about these types of things, but there's no specific mindset training, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a tricky one too, because mindset is also such a personal thing. Everyone comes into it with very different problems that they're trying to overcome and maybe very different ways to approach those problems. I wonder if things like mindset can be taught in the same way that we teach technique. I don't think, well, look, even with technique, if there's one thing that these eco guys are talking about is that one size does not fit all. Everyone learns differently. And I think the same same is probably true of mindset as well. I don't know if the answer is going to be the same for everyone because everyone has different insecurities. And depending on what's on your mind and what's bothering you, that's probably going to dictate what you need to do to advance your confidence in your own grappling. Yeah, most definitely. I find like this is... I feel like there has to be a little bit of trial and error with this where it's, oh, you kind of see what works. Like, I think everyone, at least, like, if you've competed a fair bit, you've kind of tried different things out. It's like, you try getting hyped up. You try just completely relaxing and many things in between. It's like, you kind of figure out what works for you the best. Awesome. Well, before we tie this one up, Joseph, I mean, I just want to turn this over to you and ask if you've got any final thoughts or things that you suggest for people out there that we didn't already talk about here. I mean, this is such a wide open field topic. I'm sure we could go on for days about it, but is there anything that is just ultra critical we need to share with people so that they can apply it to their own game? I mean, in terms of jujitsu, I don't know if anything in jujitsu is ultra critical, but uh, I'd probably say something, an idea that I, or a thought that I've had in the past, I've touched on this like a little bit, I guess, where trying to develop your game in a direction where you think about techniques that you're confident in, but also techniques that are efficient. Or it's like, I feel like those are two different things that you'd want to take into consideration. And I think I did a thing with like less impressed, more involved. And actually we touched on this a fair bit, but it was like, if you want to do a technique effectively, you want to be confident in it. But this isn't necessarily meaning the technique is going to be the most efficient in certain situations because everyone's going to have techniques that they prefer and they're better at. And these are the techniques you're confident in. But you want to try and make it so that these techniques that you're confident are also the more most efficient uh, for the situation, right? And just trying to think in those regards where you're not just, okay, I have this technique that I like and I'm just going to spam this. It's like, okay, what else can I fit in here? How can I start building my game so that it becomes more efficient over time? And I found that this is a, like a good way to kind of have direction. So when you're in a situation where it's like, oh, I'm not really sure what to do here. Most of my game isn't really fitting. Then you can probably think of something new that's going to be more efficient in that situation and then build confidence there. That's a really good point. Technical proficiency is not the same as technique efficiency. It's possible to be very confident and very good at a technique that maybe is just not that great a technique overall. I think everyone has a few moves like that. I mean, for me, I have a lot of like weird Kesakatame stuff that I do. I even sometimes choke people inside their own guard because I'm a lunatic. And like, I'll tell you, I'm confident in my ability to do that. And I would even go so far as to say I'm good at my ability to do that. But there's no denying that in most situations, those are like the least efficient options, right? <laughs> I, would pre- I would probably be better off doing more classical stuff that is proven to work more efficiently, more effectively, and a higher percentage of the time. So that's actually an interesting point that if you want to do anything, you want to do it with the utmost confidence, but you also want to make sure that you don't use confidence as a crutch to choose techniques that are maybe not the best choice for the moment, because that is a very easy problem to have, especially when things are not going your way in a, in a match, right? It's easy to kind of just fall back and regress to your default behavior. 
And your default behavior is not always the optimal thing to do. So I think that understanding that choosing what to do should be based more than just confidence, but based also on what is the actual best decision to make in the moment. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I mean, you could probably like, if you try choking me in my guard, it's probably going to be, you might catch me off guard. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. And I think both of these things are important because you want to have techniques you're confident in. Like if you're confident in your ability to choke someone from guard, it's like, I wouldn't encourage you to not do that, especially in a competition. Like, it depends on the situation, like how good is someone and so on. I think there are people who have certain niches where they're like very proficient at certain things that are quite obscure. And then this can be something good. You can almost push jujitsu forward in some sense if you're very good at these niche areas. But then people eventually are going to have to catch up and like kind of follow suit. So I think it's just a good guide. It's like, okay, what is the, the most efficient versus the most effective thing to do? And the most effective is kind of the move that you're most confident and proficient in. Right? And I think there are probably people who are very good at suplexing someone that they're very effective at it. But it's not maybe the most efficient from that position. And I'm probably not going to be able to do that. So... I said, <laughs> like, these are things that you're going to have to consider. And I think there's obviously a uniqueness to each individual practitioner. And you kind of want to find some things that maybe work for you that might not work for others. But then broadly speaking, you want to use, okay, what's going to be efficient as like a guideline? I'm not trying to propose that everyone like kind of cookie cutters until, okay, these are the most efficient techniques, only do them. But you want to like still retain some degree of like uniqueness uh, because I feel like that's what can really like it'll take you past the people before you, right? Because uh, if you just do what everyone's done before, it's like, there's, it's really hard to push things forward. That's a good point. And that's actually where confidence becomes important. It is very hard to challenge the status quo if you're not confident in what you're doing. It requires a high degree of confidence to innovate and to try something new, which is not to say that I try to choke people inside their guard because I'm trying to innovate. I do it because it's <laughs> hilarious, honestly. It just <laughs> amuses me. <laughs> but that said, though, if you build your entire game based around just copying what everyone else is doing. I mean, you can get pretty good doing that, but you're unlikely to become number one at anything just by copying other people. Because by definition, your goal when you do that is to emulate someone else, right? It's going to be hard to surpass someone else if you're just emulating them. At some point, you need to carve off your own identity in the sport. So I think that although, of course, we want to study and be aware of what is known to be effective, Confidence is also that variable. It's that X factor that we can all throw in because it lets all of us try new, weird, novel things. Like you said, sometimes you just catch people off guard with new, weird, novel things. I mean, it's worth pointing out, not that long ago, leg locks were that weird, new, novel thing that people weren't really sure if they worked or not. So it's all it takes is just a handful of, of crazy, confident people to change the sport forever. So I think that, again, there is merit to doing your own thing. It maybe is not always technically optimal, but I think in terms of building confidence, I think it's definitely helpful to have a thing that you've contributed and that you're good at. Well, yeah, absolutely. I can definitely vouch for hilarity being a good motivation to innovate because having like rolled with Craig, I find that this is probably his main gauge for how much he wants to innovate a technique is how funny is it going to be when he hits it. So, uh, <laughs> because I, I believe it was Craig who once said, look, anyone can submit someone with a technique, but if you can submit someone with some bullshit, that's when you know you, you really got it. That is true. You know, no one ever gets traumatized because they got submitted by an armbar. People are going to get traumatized because they got submitted with a flying go-go plata or something, right? It, it's the unique stuff that's going to stand out. Absolutely. I have been traumatized by a number of terrible things that Craig has done to me. But, uh, no, yeah, I think, yeah, because there's definitely something to be said about like both, both aspects because yeah, I definitely agree with you in everything you said just now. Where it's I was like, there, I feel like it's two sides of the coin. Where it's, you really want to be super efficient, but then you also want to. I find, at least for me, I was actually having this. I know uh, we were like wrapping up, and now we're having like a full-on conversation afterwards. But it's actually quite interesting. Where I was talking to my friend about this, where we we're talking about how I've tried to copy a lot of people's games, but I've ended up copying some of them quite poorly, or like poorly in the sense where it's not the same but then kind of like stumbling onto something a little bit more unique. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of awesome. I remember, I forgot what band was talking about this. Where basically, the way you do something different is by copying someone poorly. And they talked about they copied one band and then they did a really, really bad job of it, but then they ended up like making their own thing. And I thought, obviously, in terms of art, this I guess this can be done more easily, I guess. Whereas there isn't as much of a, it works or it doesn't in jiu-jitsu because it's like, 
oh, it works because it works, or it, and it doesn't because oh, you fought like you got, you got fucked from it. So I guess this is something that like is also quite interesting. So yeah. That is a good point. And it's something that, again, I think the eco guys have caught on to, which is that if I were to look back at all of the moves that I consider part of my A game, I don't think I do any of them the way that my coach actually taught me to. All of the stuff that I do that I've been able to make work has weird adaptations that I'm not even sure I've seen anyone else do. You know, you kind of personalize these techniques and you make them your own. Because you very quickly understand in jujitsu, there is no one right way to do a technique. Everything is so context dependent upon who you are, who they are, where you're trying to go, right? That often dictates how you do a move is where do you want to try to land when it's done. Uh, all of those things matter tremendously. And in the Japanese martial arts, in the TMAs, they actually have a concept for this. They call it shuhari. Um, it's derived from three Japanese words, shu, ha, and ri. Basically, it says there's three steps to mastery. I believe you, they are step number one is you imitate, right? And that's like white belt where you don't know any better. So you're just trying to copy as much as you can. Step two is you start to break away, uh, which is where you start to deviate off the path. And then step three is where you really innovate and you define things in your own way. And I think that's a beautiful way to look at things because... Yeah, I mean, like I said, if I look back at all of the stuff I do, even things that you would consider basic fundamentals like single leg takedowns, I don't do them at all the way that I was taught, but it works for me. And that's just the way that it is. So I think that giving yourself that permission to innovate, it requires confidence. And I think actually it might even also build confidence because then you can say, you know, you've created something, you've defined something and found something that's unique to you. And there is a joy in that, in finding something about jujitsu that kind of is unique to you. It feels kind of like you put your stamp on things. Yeah. And I think on a similar line of confidence is like when you've managed to reach a conclusion yourself, you're going to have a much better understanding of what that actually is, as opposed to just having been told, okay, it's this, this, and this. It's like, okay, I can, it's like, I think this is like a lot of what people say in terms of reverse classroom stuff, right? Where it's like, oh, you want someone to sell studies because like, you can tell people all the answers they want, but if it's an answer to a question they've never had, it's going to be very like pretty useless. It's like, you kind of want them to ask the questions and then reach their own conclusions. And maybe with some help from like the instructor, I feel like this can actually like, you can, okay, now you have a deeper understanding of this problem and then you have a greater confidence in the solution as opposed to just being, oh, I'm told this is what I should be doing, but I don't really know why. Actually, I had a conversation recently about my friend in regards to like the ecological approach. And I like a lot of it, but I find, at least for me, it's a little extreme. Like I don't want to be devoid of teaching technique, but I do think, so for example, it's like some people, it's like most people aren't going to do the same technique in the same way, but there are some people where I stole their way of doing it. And it works very well for me from like, there's so many different types of people. There are factors that can affect what types of technique you use and so on and so on, like body type and your personality per se and, and so on. And so kind of like, cause I, like for me, at least hearing that you can't teach technique, it's almost, I don't know. It's, it's different for me. I didn't necessarily agree. Like, cause my friends started trying to teach completely ecological. And so I, was, I think there's a lot to be stolen <laughs> in regards to technique and so on. And so. Figuring out people who are of similar like body type to you, similar attributes or similar personality. And I find that there's a lot to be taken from that. But I guess I try to work in the direction of like not necessarily telling people what to do, but maybe having them reach those conclusions. Yeah, I think there's value in that and kind of helping guide people towards the right answer. That is part of eco, but also it's something that as a teacher, you need to always be aware of. You cannot just bombard people with info you have to give them info at the point when they're ready to learn it. This is a mistake that a lot of black belt coaches make is they try to just bombard students with every single detail when they don't know anything and it just frustrates them and it confuses them and turns them off. And part of the beauty of that stepwise learning approach is that it's going to eventually get to the point where you can feel like you accomplished something, right? Because you climbed the ladder, you learned new aspects of this technique, and ultimately you built on and added on things that are unique to you, which always is a great feeling. Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, that's ultimately how I, oh, I think like one develops like their own style per se, but then again, subsequently their confidence in that technique is like, okay, I have a really good understanding of this. I'm confident and so on and so on. Awesome. Well, Joseph, let's tie this one up. I mean, we talked about a lot of really cool resources on this episode. I'm going to try to link to them all in the show notes to make that easy. But if people want to follow you, if they want to ask you questions, or if they want to check out your work, how do they go about doing that? The main place I'm at is Instagram, Joseph Chen JJ, so J-O-Z-E-F-C-H-E-N. 
uh, JJ. I try to respond as much as I can, but sometimes I get a little like, I'm not the best at responding to messages, but uh, feel free to like send me something there. I'll do my best to respond. Otherwise, I'm on the VT YouTube channel sometimes. So if you want to see me there, as well as I should be coming out with an instructional fairly soon in English now. So hopefully that gets out sooner than later. Nice. That's fantastic. Well, I'll put links to all of that stuff that I've got in the show notes, plus the resources we talked about here today. I'll also throw a link to our stuff, but it's easy to find. Everything we make is at bjjmentalmodels.com. But anyway, Joseph, thanks so much for coming by, man. I always love picking your brain on this kinds of stuff. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, buddy. Thanks to the listeners as well. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.